introduction. It has been quite a while since I have been asked to come and specifically speak about my journey with cancer. I am at um, Bryanston Methodist Church, as James introduced me, and there is, we have a joke, and I said last night at the finance committee, I think I need danger pay. I came into to Bryanston and was, um, I'm living with cancer. And so just after I arrived, and it's been a stormy two years, very interesting two years, Last year, I was admitted to a hospital in July, the month of July. We discovered that the cancer had spread um, to my lungs and to the lymph, except for just in the breasts. And in actual fact, was told to go home and get your things ready, my girl, because you have very little time left. And so Neil and Festus very seriously told the congregation to really get ready for my death and how we would deal with this, or how they would deal <laughs> with my death. And two weeks later, Neil was killed in a, motor car ac in, in a motorbike accident. And so I was still booked off sick at that time, but I had to get up and get on with the work. And Festus left um, for, to join his wife in another church. And at the beginning of this year, the new team with, with um, Peter Grasso and Lunga Zonka and Samilo, Santele and Samilo was admitted to hospital at the beginning of December and was diagnosed with cancer of the colon. So somehow the church um, has an interesting way of either making people sick or killing them. The one who was supposed to be dead, the one who was supposed to be dead is still very much alive. And everybody else is petrified to come and join me at BMC for in case something happens to them. There is, though, a huge privilege in being able to come and share a little bit of one's journey. I started Sunday service by asking people whether they can remember for themselves or remember their children, or in some of our cases, grandchildren, answering and responding to the question, what do you want to be one day? What do you want to be when you grow up? And I'm going to ask you to give me some examples. What are the things that you used to say or that your kids or grandchildren say to you when you ask them that? Fire. Fireman, it's always one of the first. What else? A doctor. A doctor. What else? A police officer. A police officer. Absolutely. My daughter actually said to me the other day, Mom, I think I should go into the police force. And I said, why? And she says, because I can then carry a gun. And I said, you'll have to move out the house, my girl. What else? Teacher. Teacher. Doctors, lawyers, all the kinds of things. Now I want you to open your packet and take out inside of it a stone and a piece of chalk. At the back of the stone, we have painted some chalkboard paint. And I want to ask you to think back a little bit and put down one word that represents something that you used to want to be, a dream that you had. Just one word and write it down for me. Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to wait till you grow up. Eh? <laughs> Just write down that word. At the back on the chalk, chalkboard. Okay. I want you to just hold that stone for a minute. Because in a sense, for some of us, the word that could be written on that stone would represent some form of loss and some form of dream which perhaps has never been fulfilled. I want you just to hold it for a moment.
Now, may I be so bold to say that the things which we don't hear when we ask our children is that when I grow up, I want to be divorced. When I grow up, I want to be without work. I want to be retrenched. When I grow up, I want to be diagnosed with a terminal disease. I want to be in broken relationships. And yet, if I asked you again, would there be anyone here who has not experienced some of that pain and disillusionment in their life? And so I want you to erase the word that you've written. Just rub it out with your hand. And perhaps write down a word that reflects some of the deepest pain that you have ever experienced in your own life. Whether it be a divorce, whether it be the loss of a child, the loss of a loved one, maybe also a terminal disease. Just write that down. And then again, may I invite you just to hold the stone. Just to hold it. Because my sharing my story tonight resonates with you or hopefully will resonate with you purely because each of you have journeyed through some very tricky times yourself. And so let me share with you mine. I was 36 years old, probation minister at Durban North, fit, healthy, riding the crest of the wave, and one morning discovered a lump in my breast. It is interesting that in reflecting, when I discovered that lump, I knew. The church was situated directly opposite the offices, the rooms of the radiographers. And so I went for a mammogram. In those days, they didn't have all these fancy things where you could immediately go in for biopsies and the, all the other sonars and whatever else is available today. But as they did the mammogram, the radiologist came in and said to me, I need to say to you that I do not need to wait for any further investigation. You have breast cancer. And I will never forget that in walking back, just from across the road back to the office, how unbelievably my life had changed in the matter of four or five minutes after receiving the diagnosis. It was a completely different person who walked back to the church. I could not believe how my body had betrayed me. Because if you if I had gone for some life insurance examinations or whatever, I would have been found to be healthy and fit. It was the furthest possible thing from my mind. And I felt deeply betrayed. And then I walked back into the church having to share this. And I must say to you that the reactions of people were incredibly interesting. I happened to work with a colleague that James will know very well, Colin Andrews, the most spectacular minister. I always used to say every probationer should have the privilege of working with Colin for a few years. And him and his wife, Chris, were incredible gifts to me. 
But we had some very interesting responses to my cancer. I had comments thrown at me like, I remember the two secretaries sitting in the office and I was in my office and I heard someone come in and the person said to them, you know, Daleen must have always feared cancer because God gives us the things we fear so that we can overcome them. I did not need to step outside the office. My secretaries dealt with them decisively. We had people say things like, how can this happen to a minister? How come God doesn't protect even ministers? What hope is there for the likes of us lay people? Colin and I then did a dialogue sermon just before I went in for, for my op. And he asked me certain questions in the service. And the first question that he asked me what, was, what happened in your life the years just before this diagnosis? And then he asked me, where is God for you in this diagnosis? And the third question he asked me was, why do you need cancer at this stage of your life? And you know, there have been questions that I have journeyed with throughout. I went to Bristol Cancer Help Center, had a stunning week in which I shared my life story and heard other people's life stories. It is still a dream of mine after 21 years that I will one day be able to be part of a center for healing and wholeness. But in everything, there has been an incredible realization of a number of things. The one is, where is God in all of this? There was a period after I had done or during the time of radiation in which I came back to Colin and Chris and I said, you know, I'm not a hugely polite person, so excuse me. Um, I can't stand, I'm being taped, so I'll, I'll use decent words. Um, I can't stand the fact that something that is supposed to be healthy for me, everybody else has to hide behind a meter thick wall. A meter thick wall with a radiation machine, yeah. Because it's so unhealthy for them to be exposed to any of this. And I said to Colin, I have never in my life felt so alone as when I am in that room. And he said, remember the question I asked you when we did our dialogue sermon? Where is God when you are being radiated? And you know, as ministers, we have to make confession sometimes. We can say many things with our lips, but sometimes it does not originate from the heart. Present company always excluded. <laughs> but as he asked that question, I realized the reality of what I'd been preaching and not understood myself. That in actual fact, God was being radiated with me. He was not waiting out there behind the meter thick wall. And my entire treatment took on a whole different perspective. I was then clear for 12 years, came up to Johannesburg, entered another very, very difficult community at Florida that had been fractured by a minister who had been in an affair, another minister who was completely burnt out and came into a community maybe a little bit like Bryanston just not knowing what they were about and where they were going. And of course, four or five years after being at Florida, the second diagnosis came after 12 years. And at that stage, the cancer had advanced fairly significantly. I am not a massive proponent of traditional medicines. My son at that stage was 18 months old and I was told you will not see him turn two if you do not go through the op and do chemotherapy. But chemo put me in bed for two years. And then, of course, it is not just the betrayal of your body, 
But now it was that my very identity had been stripped away from me. I'm a complete workaholic. I just love being a minister. And now, for a period of two years, I could not preach. I could do nothing for my community. And so you reflect on what, what do you actually mean? What does it mean to be useless and still loved by God? Is it even something that could be real? I remember sitting, bathing this one, and being so sick, feeling so ill, that I thought, wouldn't it just be wonderful just to fall over into the water and end it? And that was a journey for two years, and somehow, in those two years, I needed again to discover what I had preached often, but it never actually internalized. That my value does not lie in anything that I do or bring supposedly with a skill set into a community. But that my value lies in the fact that God's fingerprint is on me. And that is why we can say that people who have mental disabilities, people who are hugely phys physically challenged, that they have value not because of what they bring to life, but simply because of who they are in life. And for us as a Christian community, it translates into the fact that God's fingerprint is on me. And so in actual fact, whether I am able to stand in front of a congregation and minister, whether I am able to counsel people in need, whether I am able to offer retreats, that is not my value. My value is actually as significant being useless in a bed for two years as it is in coming into a community to help restore it. And I must say to you, it was for me a deep struggle because my identity, as with many, many, not just ministers, but wherever you may find yourself in your workplace, our identities become locked in to this idea that we need to achieve and bring things to the table. You must listen to a bunch of ministers when we get together. We're actually quite disgusting. Again, always present company excluded. <laughs> but you know, you will hear us clack and clook around each other and impressing each other with what a tough week we've had, how busy we've been, how many call outs we've had, and you might have worked 60 hours, James, but do you know I did 70 this last week? And we see that as something to be proud of. In actual fact, we ought to hang our heads in shame. Because what is our ministry to our community when we tell you that your value and mine hinges on just how much I have damaged my body and my soul in working the hours I think that is okay? Somehow, a terminal disease brings us to places of reality that very few other things bring. Let me tell you, when you have sat next to the toilet vom vomiting out your lungs for month after month, when you are bald because you have lost every bit of hair on your head, there is not a huge amount of dignity left. And somehow to look at yourself in the mirror with a scarred body an attempt to wrap something that doesn't just look like a dish towel around your head and being too sick to really interact with anyone or anything teaches us lessons in reality 
like very, very few other things do. It is a similar experience that people have with addictions when they come face to face with when they actually end in the gutter. It is a similar thing when your relationships that have built you come to an end and you feel that you are nothing, that actually you are less than trash. And that's why I say that stone will tell your life story in this. It will reflect some of the stuff I'm saying to you tonight. In struggling through that, in having a church that loved me beyond what I could have in my wildest. Can you imagine a church supporting a minister for two years who never darkened your, your pulpit, never visited a person, never attended a meeting, but they cared for me for two years. I had meals on my table pre-prepared. I had fruit and veg delivered. At his age, one of the churches, I was superintendent at the time in my circuit, cooked specific babies' meals for him that were placed in the D. Two years. Can you imagine the love of a God reflected through a community in that way? And then as I came to the end of my, my second year, which would have been the end of my 10 years there, and time for me to move on, they said, Daylene, you're too weak to go into another church. Don't you want to stay here for another little while and just recover? And I said, I can't do that to you guys. You need a minister. You need someone who can actually come and be your minister. And through a long story, I eventually ended up in the four-way circuit. The two years I put myself through chemotherapy did nothing except damage my body further. And so I was not in remission. And in actual fact, as you know, last year, when through some miraculous, God is interesting. I thought I was having a stroke. I woke up one night. My children were in a terrible state. I was rushed to, to hospital. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't speak. I couldn't pick up anything. And so for me, the only thought that went through my head was I was having a stroke. It turned out I had vestibular, vestibular uh, neuritis, which is a, a virus that attacks the middle ear um, and the vestibular of the, of the ear. And so you're just off balance. You can do nothing. You're a little bit like a zombie or somebody that's high on drugs. But because they did the CT scan, they then realized, or I then realized when I opened my my the results when I was discharged on the day. None of the doctors came and told me. I don't know whether they thought I already knew. But as I opened um, the results from the CT scan, because they said the brain was clear. They just wanted to make sure there was nothing wrong with the brain. I can tell you there's lots wrong with the brain. They don't need a CT scan for that. But we then realized that the cancer had spread from, from the breasts to the lymph to the lungs. And so it's like buckshot. And the lungs and I was diagnosed with stage four terminal cancer when I eventually did take that to my doctors. So what did I and what am I learning? There are a couple of things. Cancer is not a punishment from God. No disease is. There are certain physical laws that are in place and some of us are more disposed to it than others. Both my parents died of cancer. It is most certainly not a punishment. But I have discovered that if we allow God, it can be a gift. And I ask your forgiveness if you find that offensive. But cancer taught me far more than what it's ever taken away from me. It taught me that I only have today. Frankly, so do you. 
You just don't have a diagnosis. Some of you may, but most of you might just not have the diagnosis to give you that reality check. And so it did teach me to let go of the things which don't really have much significance. Don't sweat the small stuff anymore. Live life to the full. And I know these are cliches that you hear all the time, but may I invite you to process what it would be like for you if you were told, go home and get your things ready. Would you live differently to what you do today? Because if you tell me, yes, you would live differently, may I encourage you to, to journey with that? What would you be, diff be doing differently? Maybe you wouldn't work as hard. Maybe you wouldn't live in Joburg. You see, because we have given up the gift that is the present for a future that is like candy floss. And so we talk nonsense when we say, one day when I retire, one day when my kids are out of home. Really? What about if that one day never comes? When I sit with people who are terminally ill and I have a passion for the work of people who are dying, particularly people who are dying of cancer, I am yet to come across a person who says, I regret not having worked harder. But I have had many people who have said to me, I wish I had not worked as hard. I wish I had taken more time to enjoy my kids or my grandchildren, to have more animals. And I have 24 cats and three dogs and one rabbit and soon to be four rabbits. And I love it. And I have an agreement with God and my congregation gets hugely offended when I say this. I have an agreement with God the first 10,000 years, no people, just animals. Even if I have to poop scoop, I do not mind. But may I just rest for 10,000 years? Because we are a people who are so hard on ourselves. We do not get it. The kind of love that God has for us. And so I close with my biggest learning from cancer. And that is no matter how broken you are, you can be completely whole. The doctors tell me I'm dying. And I have never felt this whole in my entire life. Now, if this is what the promise of death does to us, may we all be blessed with terminal diseases. We have placed in our very sickening understandings of life. A picture of what wholeness looks like. And we have missed all of the realities of it. Because I could be a marathon athlete and be a hugely broken person. And I can be on a deathbed and be more whole than most around me. I want to ask you to rub out the word that you wrote on your stone. And I want you to write the word whole. Just the word whole. And I am whole on there.
And then I'd like you to hold that stone again and for you to just close your eyes in a time of prayer. Lord God, when our lives begin, and as we grow up, we sometimes have an idea of what our lives should look like or what we would like them to look like. And the reality for most of us is that our lives take very different paths and journeys. We acknowledge at this time of Lent that we are a broken people. But that somehow Lent teaches us that you come and scoop us up in your arms, all the little bits that have broken off along the way. And that somehow you hold us back in that embrace into a place of renewal. And so we pray this journey for these 40 days that you will help us to see the picture of ourselves as you see us when you look at us. And so I invite you just for a few seconds as you hold that stone to begin to imagine what God sees when he looks at you. What would you look like if you were whole? What would you look like when God scoops up all the broken pieces and transforms you into whatever that you could not even imagine in your wildest dreams. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. I am very happy to take some questions or comments or reflections. I must tell you that as recent as about three months ago, I received an email from one of my present congregation members who, in listening to some of my journey with cancer, felt the need to write me an email to say, there is obviously something drastically wrong in your life that God disapproves of, and that is why you have cancer and will not be healed. And I know that I am not the only one who gets that kind of reaction when people are diagnosed. Yeah, any questions? Yes. You know, um, yes, how do I handle, um, it's understanding how do I handle that I have cancer and I have children. I have Richard who is now seven and a half. Is that right, boy? How old are you? Oh, sure, double digits. Oh, mom. My double digit boy, 10 years old. I have a foster child, a daughter of 24, and she has a little girl um, of four, Cleo. And so we have, with the cats and the dogs and the rabbits, um, three of us, three children with me in the home. When my diagnosis came the second time around, Richard was only 18 months. Bonnie was not with us at that stage. And so he was far too young at that stage to understand anything. But four years later, when the diagnosis was reconfirmed and that nothing had had improved and in actual fact I had not gone into remission. We were at a place where I needed to explain what is happening and what was going to happen. And I do believe that children are not stupid. They know something is going on and I think that if one helps them to understand what it means, that it does not necessarily become easier but less scary if they know. 
So Richard knows that I have cancer. Richard knows that particularly last year that I was very ill and that we were talking about where he would go when I died, um, what family he would, move, would, would go to. The person came to visit with us. We spoke about even rooms in the house and so on, hey, my boy, um, and who would be the brothers and sisters and that. I think that has been one of the most difficult parts in the journey. I think my kids get very sensitive when I sneeze. They think I'm dying. Um, so I need to reassure them and say it's just a cold. I think I'll survive this one. But my kids do live with a reality that every day is a gift. And I say that my, when I see my GP, the first thing that I come when I come in, she always says to me, are you still alive? I mean, very reassuring words from your doctor. And... <laughs> but I say to my congregation as well, every day is a gift. And every morning I wake up as a surprise. And it's not the worst way to live. Yeah. So we have a covenant with each other. We have a date every week. That is our date. And it was usually Fridays until basketball trumped mom's time. And so we need to find another slot but it does mean that relationships become very sharply focused because they're a heck of a lot more important than a messed up congregation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I do think it's important that our kids do know. They don't need to know absolutely every bit of stuff going on, but they do need to know. It is far worse if they wake up and something has gone wrong and they've not had a clue. Yeah. Has it been hard for you, my boy? It's sometimes difficult, eh? Yeah. But it makes us appreciate each other a heck of a lot more as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And it is that balance because the question is about the balance between how do I live for myself, how do I live for others, the pull between the two. Christianity has placed a very unnecessary burden on people. And it is the burden of always doing, always doing for others, always being busy. We, we have a retreat center at BMC. I run retreats once a month for us there. And I'm busy. When church life gets a bit tough, um, it never gets tough here, I'm sure, but where I am, it sometimes gets a bit tough. And then I say I need to get my, my toes in the soil. And I go and work in a garden which is yet to really come to fruition. I think that I have learned that I can only be of value to others if I take care of myself first. It's not always a lesson that I adhere to. and My kids will often remind me of that. But unless I actually value myself, how do I with any authenticity value other people? If I'm disposable, you disposable. Does that make sense? So the extent to which I care for myself is the extent to which I place value on you as a human being in my community and in my circle. So it is that balance. But unless it starts with me, I am absolutely useless to the community out there. I love when I do wild women's retreats. I haven't done that for a long time. But... As part of that, we talk about our identities and how we express ourselves. And I remember it, uh, a retreat that I ran very early on in my ministry at a center. What was the center? Um, Common Ground that Philip used to run. And there was an older woman. She must have been like my age now, 55. Uh, I was much younger then. And discovered that she had for about 10 years 
had this ritual that once a week she would go into one of the shopping centers. She would dress to the, uh, to the nines. She would have on high heel shoes, hair done, fancy dressing, and that would be her queen for the day experience. And so she would walk into the shopping centers and she would greet people and <laughs> engage in conversations and just have an absolute blast in doing stuff like that. And I think it's an invitation. Also, when, you know, when life is not so certain, you don't need to be so prim and proper anymore, and it's wonderful. Um, it, yeah, life becomes valued. Yeah. Devine, what's quizzed in my mind, how do you respond to that dear person who said that you have done something wrong and God is punishing you or you've got an unconfessed sin in your life because, you know, Jesus said it and that's what it is. I must tell you that I do not even have the slightest inclination to even respond to people like that anymore. My need to convince idiots to truth is long gone. Um, if they were, can you imagine the punishment they live with for themselves? Because everything that goes wrong in their life will be as a result of their relationship with God not working. And for me, I have just personally, I do not want to, it's like arguing with drunk people. I don't want to engage with people who see God as this ogre. Because it's not even just a stricter God, it's a completely different God to what I have and understand and know. Um, so I don't even respond to that anymore, James. Uh, maybe I just don't have the energy to, but I have no inclination to. Get, you can't even get into a theological argument with a person like that, because it's like rabbit fundamentalists. People are really like drunks. You can't, you, you would never argue with a drunk person. Wait till they sober up, and then you can have a reasonable conversation. And so I, I walk away. I choose to walk away for my own health. Also, I would like to not spend the last months in prison. Um, so. <laughs> there was a hand up here. Yeah. Yeah, I do not. Um, I believe that my, my experience with chemo was the wrong decision in retrospect. I've always been into holistic medicine, um, which was part of my journey at Bristol. And at the moment, um, I take alternative um, medicines and diet and all kinds of other things to manage my cancer. I also do a lot of meditation. Um, it is part of my daily schedule. And I believe that that too, and letting go of some of the stuff that hurt us, I believe that's incredibly important. And I believe it's part of the reason why I'm still standing, very much so. And there are things that are out in nature that have healing properties that we have not even begun to explore. Yeah, so absolutely, absolutely. Anyone, anything else? James. Just another one, sorry. Um, when you pray for people who are sick, is it not in a sense, or how do you feel, or how do you respond, or how does the person who you're praying for respond and say, you're praying for me, yet you are sick and not healed? Yes. So how, I mean... Is there actual value in you praying for me because God's not listening to you? Yeah, so how will he listen to you for me? To you to me? Absolutely. I, I must say I have never actually had someone express that. I'm sure some of them have thought that. And I think part of that comes with how do we understand healing? Healing for me is not I'm sick, I am cured and eventually later on in my life I will get sick and die again. Those for me are just rhythms of life, like good and bad stuff that happen. 
It's part of John 10, 10, life in all its fullness, which actually means I will have the ups and downs if I experience life in all its fullness. So illness for me becomes part of that. I do believe that death is ultimate healing. And so my understanding of healing is very different. Most of the people that I journey with will understand some of that through some of the courses that they've attended, some of my preaching they have heard. I also believe that God has to remain God in all of this. Because very often we assume for ourselves almost the authority and the title of God in how we deal with people. And I think that when we care for one another, there needs to be a far greater sense of humility in realizing that we are the speck. And there is this God who is this entire universe full God who somehow, in my opinion, understands suffering very differently to what I do. Am I allowed to use you as an example in something, my boy? I'm sorry, you can get hold of me in the car afterwards. He came home and had been given a neck chop by somebody at basketball, unintentionally, but so the neck is a little bit sore. Did I show a lot of sympathy when you told me? Did I? Did you think, oh, no, oh, then I'm on the, okay. I didn't feel a lot of sympathy. It's, sorry, my baby. It, it is what it is. Kids play, they get sore. He'll be over that soon. He's been sick. Mom is reasonably impatient with people. So we do all the right things that moms need to do, but we know he's going to be better. I do believe that God sees a bigger picture when he looks at us with our health and with our illnesses. Not that he doesn't care, but there is a reality of a bigger picture at work. I don't know whether this makes sense to you when I say this. I think that we are far more concerned about our illnesses and our healings than what maybe God would be. And I'm saying this hugely carefully because I don't want to sound callous and I don't want to present to God that doesn't care. The greater learning for me in this is that I have a God who holds me. Whether I am well or whether I am ill. I have a God that holds me whether I am in trouble or whether I am riding the crest of the wave. And that holding is for me what Christian joy is all about. Now, when I start living with that kind of joy, I start living with less fear because I think we are a fearful people. We are afraid of everything. We are afraid we're going to get work. We are afraid we're not going to get work. We're afraid we're going to get married or not get married. We're afraid we're going to make it. We're afraid we're going to fail. We're afraid of success. It was Nelson Mandela, was it not, who said, it is not our darkness that scares us most. It is our light. The possibilities within us that scare us most. So when we can let go of the fear because we truly believe that God holds us, we start living our lives a little bit differently. We start living it with a confidence which let go of some of the things that used to keep us awake at night. When I left Florida, I had no income and no home. Look after your minister well. I had nowhere to go to. I had no assurance of an income after the end of that December. I have in my family a very wealthy uncle who really doesn't want much to do with me because of the way he understands my church and my lifestyle. Who came out of the blue to say, I have a home, I think you might be in trouble and I have a home that you can go and live in. In which I lived, and I always say I have to apologize because it was the year that the market fell out the properties. And I have to apologize that globally that had to happen so that I could get a house. 
because if he would, would have been able to sell it, he would never have given it to me to move into. So my apologies for all of you who lost significant properties in that time. But somehow, God cared. No church would have wanted me in the condition that I was in. And I was stationed in a large circuit who was able to say to me, work as you can, not as you can't. And set me free to get back on my feet for a year or two. And now they can get a pound of flesh. There's quite a lot of flesh to get hold of here. So they can get their pound of flesh out of me again. So there has been, and it's not an easy journey, and let me tell you, I often falter on this. But there has been a journey of understanding that my most basic needs, God is not just aware of, but actually cares about. But it is in a far bigger picture to what I would understand or would be able to care for myself. So I'm not quite sure I've answered your question, but yeah. And I most certainly don't have all the answers here, James. This is for me also still a journey. The opposite, I must say, at BMC has become interesting. People have looked at me and they say to me, you may have cancer, but we see God at work in your life somehow. And it is for us a miracle because it's a very black and white community. You either work or you're out. And so for them, there is, I think there's been part of the gospel that has been renewed in a different way. My brokenness has become a ministry for them, not my, my toughness and my togetherness and being able to make everything work. My very brokenness has become part of my ministry for them. And that's been meaningful for me and for some of them. There might be some CEOs who kind of say, I wonder whether she gets all the hours of work in, <laughs> in a day that she should, but they're in the minority. Any other questions? I want to say thank you. You, you have deeply respected me by just listening, by just allowing me to express some of my journey some of the places where I have found healing, some of the places where I'm still very raw in places like this, like this. But thank you for the gentleness with which you have listened. And thank you for a deep sense of care that I feel from you. Thank you for inviting me, Jane.